بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الأحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله We're going to read inshallah a few haraqas through this book Asas al-Taqdis sections of this book The Foundations of the Sacred written by Al-Imam Al-Mujadid Al-Alama Fakhruddin Al-Razi Rahimahullah Ta'ala Wa Imam Al-Razi dies at the beginning of the 7th century, 606 after Hijri. He was murdered by the Karamiyyah. That's very important for you to note. You should research who, who are the Karamiyyah, what did they believe? Who are also called the Mujassima, those who believe that God has a, had a physical form. They actually poisoned him and they also slandered him. So a lot of the things you hear about Imam Al-Razi, they're untrue and they come from the origin comes from Al-Karamiyyah. Uh, Imam Al-Razi rahimahullah ta'ala, mashallah alayhi. Uh, Imam Al-Siyuti -si mentions him in his poem on the revivers of Islam, which we're going to teach here inshallah ta'ala in the future and at Swiss. Khalas, Imam Al-Siyuti -si who dies 9-11 after Hijri, almost 300 years later, he praised Fakhruddin Al-Razi rahimahullah. Go and read what Imam Taj uh, Asuki, rahimahullah, he wrote in Tabaqat al Shafi'iyah about Imam al Razi, rahimahullah ta'ala. Maybe some people will say, well, Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he wrote a, a book, it's a large book, attacking al Razi. So what? People can write books about people all the time. Doesn't mean what they wrote is correct. And it also doesn't equate to that one person's opinion being, a, being the final judgment on the other person, especially when we have the majority of Ahl Sunnah, Hatta Al Azhar, praising Imam Al Razi, Rahimahullah, and also being critical of Imam Al Razi, like Imam Al Nasafi, for example, in his Muqaddimah. The point is, you want to be mature and avoid sectarian differences, sectarian, excuse me, differences as much as you can and be someone that has an open heart, someone that is mature, is emotionally centered, and that stuff hasn't done a lot for us. The second sort of criticism directed towards the Imam is that, and I said this before years ago, may Allah forgive me, that everything in his, is in his tafsir except tafsir. And I said that out of my ignorance over 20 years ago. And the reason that people say that, as I heard from, from one of our teachers in Al-Azhar years ago, is that most of us don't have the skill set to appreciate what is real tafsir. It's like if you go to a really nice restaurant and you eat really, really nice food, you might not like the taste of it because you and I, we're used to In-N-Out or Chick-fil-A as long as it's halal or whatever. We're used to that, 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 that kind of street food. So we, not be, we may not be able to appreciate fine dining that's halal because we never had it before. Well, that's on us. That's why the poet says, if the eye is infected, don't blame the painter. If the tongue is infected, don't blame the chef. So nowadays, what does tafsir mean? Tafsir has been reduced in the English language to gems, to numerical miracles of the Quran, to how many times days appear in the, war, in the Quran. The, the, these were never the purposes of tafsir. That was salt on the food. The purpose of tafsir was to bring the guidance of Islam into the different aspects of life so that people will see the light of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and follow that light until they worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That's why just a hundred years ago, a Shaykh Muhammad Abdu in Lebanon, he used to teach in a church, uh, excuse me, in a mosque. And Christians would come to him in his tafsir. And people asked him, like, why are you here? They said, Nastafid, we benefit from the Shaykh. Now the reductivism and the need to turn knowledge into entertainment has reduced Islamic studies to the point that we may not recognize really what the ulama and our teachers are teaching. And so then we get frustrated. We are projecting our own secular modern state, if you will, on Islamic studies. That's dangerous, man. And vice versa, we also have to think critically in both ways, but you get the idea, Imam, Al-Razi, subhanAllah, his tafsir, tafsir is really incredible. I remember, you know, a few years ago, there was a teacher who said, Wallahi rahimahullah, if, a great Hanafi scholar from Azhar, if I set 
I'm trying to remember what he said. I could write 50 pages on one verse of Quran and not repeat myself. And he used to say, I could sit and teach that one verse for a month, every day, one lesson, and I would not repeat myself. SubhanAllah, so maybe the problem isn't a Razi, maybe the problem is me. So let me start with myself. Imam al-Razi, he, here on page 155, he introduces us to something very important. He says, فِي بَيَانِ أَنَّ جَمِيعَ فُرَقَ الْإِسْلَامِ مُكِرُّونَ بِأَنَّهُ لَا بُدَّ مِنَ التَّأْوِيلِ فِي بَعْضِ ذَوَاهِرِ الْقُرْآنِ وَالْأَخْبَارِ Now, he says that this section is going to clarify the fact that every sect of Islam has to acknowledge that there are certain texts in the Quran and certain texts from the Sunnah of Sayyid al-Aqwan, which if we were to accept their explicit meaning would be a problem, meaning there has to be interpretation, what we call ta'wil. We'll talk about ta'wil inshallah in the future. Ta'wil ba'id, ta'wil qareeb, and so on and so forth. Do we have examples of this though? For example, in the fifth chapter of the Quran, verse 6, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after Audhu Billahi min ash-shaytan rajim Ya ayyuha al-lazina amanu idha qumtum ila salati faghsiru juhakum. O you who believe, if you stand to pray, faghsiru, then wash. Fa'ashart ba'da'i al-mashroot. If you stand to pray, then wash. If you interpret that verse literally, that's what it means. That's why, mashallah, some of the, the ulama of Usul, they said, تَأْوِيلُ هَذِهِ آيَةٍ بِمَنْطِقِ aql." Right, that this verse, you have to interpret it because nobody goes, Allahu Akbar, فَغْسِلُ and then starts to make wudu. So if you were to interpret that verse as it is explicitly as it exists explicitly in the Quran, then you, you, would, you would be engaged in bid'ah. What's called dalalatul iqtida, you have to interpret that. The statement of Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, innamal amalu bi niyat, actions are by intentions. Every single action, every single action right now, I'm rocking back and forth, because I'm, oh, am I having an intention for that? No. Is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi truthful? Taba'an, without any doubt. So that means We have to interpret the hadith here. We cannot go to the explicit meaning of the hadith because that would mean every single thing we do, every single action that exists and happens is by niyyah. So here we say, we, we have to make ta'wil. So Imam al-Razi is saying that there are going to be times in the Qur'an that every single group of Islam acknowledges a ta'wil. We know that Ahlul Sunnah, Alhamdulillah, when it comes to this issue, they fall in the middle, Alhamdulillah, between the extremes. There's also the example of the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his hadith Qudsi. Wallahu well, subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to a person on the day of judgment, I was sick, right? And you didn't care for me. And the person will respond, recognizing the transcendence of Allah, and say, How could I have it? How could I have I visited you? And now we see ta'wil. If you would have visited someone who was sick, you would have visited me. So we learn this not only from the principles of our Usul, Usul of Fiqh, but also in the text themselves, like the sixth verse of the fifth chapter of the Quran. If you interpret it literally, you become from Ahlul Bid'ah. And the hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, another example, forgetfulness has been removed from your Ummah. Rufi'a an Ummati an Nisyan. Forgetfulness has been removed from my Ummah. Wallahi, I wish this was true. I'd tell my family this. <laughs> I forget things all the time. 
So we have to interpret this hadith because, of course, we all forget. What does it mean? The sin of forgetfulness has been removed, is, is forgiven of my ummah. لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا. So we're going to go through this, and I think it's very important because oftentimes English-speaking Muslims have only been exposed to one understanding, the asaf shadid, and they assume that the early Muslims never made tatweed, that the early Muslims never interpreted texts, the dawahir of the nusus, the explicit text. So we're going to address that, insha'Allah ta'ala. And again, I'm not here to argue and fight with people. I don't have time for that. Um, I'm just here to share information. Feel free to differ. That's no problem. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. But you're not going to find me engaging in back and forth and all that stuff. لا. قال الإمام الرازي رحمه الله بعد أن قال after he said في بياني أن جميع فرق الإسلام مقرون بأنه لا بد من التأويل في بعض ظواهر القرآن والأخبار والأخبار إلى حديث يعني so the reason I'm reading this Arabic is for my students um, and some of also my teachers to engage me later on. We can continue these discussions and some of my colleagues. But Imam Razi says, this introduction here, we have to recognize that every group of Islam admits that there are certain times that they have to make interpret the explicit meaning of text. Why? Think about what the book is talking about, to preserve the sanctities. If we were not going to interpret every single action is based on an intention and forgetfulness has been removed from my ummah, if we were to take those hadith literally, that would imply a'udhu billah, that we did not believe the Prophet was truthful because that's not the truth. We forget and everything we do is not based on intention. So there is what called daladatul iqtida, we have to interpret. So the whole purpose of this from the framework of Ahl Sunnah, as learned from the Sahaba and the Salaf, as we'll see soon, was to preserve the transcendence of Allah Azza wa Jal in our minds, because Allah doesn't need preserving, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and other things, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And, and take this as a slow ride, this is a process, and I think it'll be more than two halaqa, inshaAllah. And it's important to note that the Salaf as Imam al nawi he mentions, and Imam Al-Khattabi, and Imam Al-Bayhaqi, and others, they had two ways to do this when it came to running into problematic, explicit texts. The first is tafweed, to suspend the meaning to Allah, Allah knows. The second, a ta'wil, to interpret it in a way which preserves the majesty of Allah. Now we're talking specifically about Allah, not about wudu and salah. Or in regards to the Prophet ﷺ, to interpret his words in a way that preserves his isma. His isma. So with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the purpose here is to preserve his taqdis, his transcendence, his ulu. Does distance him from idolatry or any comparisons with the prophets, specifically Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The purpose of this ta'wil is to preserve their isma, that they have been protected from doing anything that would contradict their responsibilities and roles as prophets. And now the Shaykh, we're going to move on to the text. Waqara al Imam Rahimuhullah. أما في القرآن فبيانه في وجوه. So now he's going to give examples where interpretation of the explicit meaning has to happen, or it will contradict a major principle of Al Islam. So the interpretation دلالة الاقتضاء. He says رحمه الله الأول هو أنه ورد في القرآن ذكر الوجه وذكر العين وذكر الجنب. الواحد وذكر الأيدي وذكر الساق الواحدة فلو أخذنا بظاهر يلزمنا إثبات شخص له شخص له وجه واحد وعلى ذلك الوجه أعين كثيرة وله جنب واحد وعليه أيد كثيرة وله ساق واحدة ولا نرى 
في الدنيا شخصا أقبح صورة من هذه الصورة المتخيلة ولا أعتقد أن عاقلا يرضى بأن يصف ربه بهذه الصفة hmm. So the Sheikh he says first is that in the Quran we find words in the context of talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like al wajh face, an eye, a cheek, hands, a shin, one shin. He said, فَلَوْ أَخَدْنَا بِظَاهِرِ A, if we were to take the literal meaning of those words, يُلْزِمْنَا إِثْبَاتَ شَخْصٍ لَهُ وَجْهٌ واحد. We would have to then assume that this, we would be affirming a, a person that has one face, and on that face are many eyes, and one cheek, and many hands, and one shin. وَلَا نَرَى فِي الدُّنْيَا شَخْصًا أَقْبَحُ سُورَةً مِنْ هَذِهِ الصُورَةِ الْمُتَّخَيَّلَةِ And there is no person on the face of the earth that is ugly as that description. وَلَا أَعْتَقِدْ أَنَّ عَاقِلًا يَرْضَى بِأَنْ يَصِفَ رَبَّهُ بِهَذِهِ الصِّفَةِ he says, and I, there is no way I could accept or believe or contend that anyone with any semblance of intelligence would be pleased to describe their Lord like this. So he's giving now, this is of course like a, a logical argument that if you were to interpret all of those texts in the Quran, Sifat al Khabariya, literally, what type of literal creation would you have? A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim. And the Prophet said, In Allah Jamilu, Hibbul Jamal, Allah is beautiful, He loves beauty. So we'll stop here and then, inshallah, next time we're going to start to move through the different ayat that Sayyidina Imam al Razi uses for examples to teach this important principle. Barakallahu feekum, wa jazakum Allahu khairan, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa sallam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.